Welcome to 3SN, everybody. I'm Alex, the same guy, and with me is James No Doubt Dotson, the mad scientist. Will not be joining us tonight, so me and Jimmy here will be going over the top wide receivers for this upcoming fantasy football season. Jimmy, how goes it? Hey, going well over here. Uh, it's another day. It means we're another day closer to the fantasy season, my man. Exactly. Best time of the year. But, um, all right, well, let's get right into it. Um, I feel like the most interesting part in breaking these wide receivers would be the top five. Because I feel like the top five and even the top ten, after that, there's a pretty significant drop-off in quality of the receivers. But that's just my opinion. Um, how do you feel about that? Who do you got in your top five? Well, uh, we are all three of us are a unanimous decision with uh, Antonio Brown at number one. Um, the, the top five in our consensus is Antonio Brown, one, Odell Beckham, two, Jordy Nelson at number three, Des Bryant at number four, and uh, me and our old friend Julio Jones down by the schoolyard rounding out the top five. And those are actually my top five as well, just not quite in that order. Uh, let's just go right down the list. I'm going to start with Antonio Brown, and uh, you tell me, Alex, how can you go wrong with a guy who's going to get over 100 catches and uh, probably double-digit touchdowns yet again this year? How can you go wrong with a guy like that? You know, he's been the man, so I think he's might even have a, a better year. I think he's going to have around 126 catches, 1,700 receiving yards, and maybe even 15 to 16 touchdowns. And, you know, he's the focal point of the Steelers' offense, other than maybe Le- Le'Veon Bell. So I just think, you know, he's Captain Obvious here. Look what he's done the last two years. Yeah, no kidding. And if uh, if all the reports are correct about uh, the Steelers trying to get 30 points per game and that's what they're expecting, you know Antonio Brown's going to be a big part of that. Now, another thing to keep in mind, too, depending on how your league is set up, uh, if you get points for return yards or return touchdowns, like you know, Alex, you and I are in a league that works that way, it's just a little bit of an added bonus that makes Antonio Brown even more valuable. And what really gets me, and I just read this and I wish I could find the stat again, but it was more or less that over – the past two years, like it's like 22 straight weeks, something ri- something ridiculous like that, uh, he has not had a game where he has scored under six fantasy points. Wow. I mean, uh, it, the consistency is unbelievable. The high-quality output, I mean, eight times he went over 100 yards last year. And again, double-digit touchdowns, obviously, no doubt, number one. Now, number two, a guy we don't know really much about except for the fact that his – hands are probably bigger than my two hands put together. Odell Beckham Jr. missed four games last year with the uh, suspension, but uh, came on strong and practically put up numbers that you would have expected he played all year. You're a lot higher on him than I am, though. Talk to me about what you like about him. Okay, well, as you and the mad scientist know, I'm all about what have you done for me lately, and I'm all about momentum. Look what he did the last six games of the year. 60 receptions, 140, 842 yards, and nine touchdowns. If you can, like, make that equivalent to a 16-game slate, and you'd get 160 catches, 2,245 yards, and 24 scores. Now, of course, that doesn't always translate into that, but I think you get the point I'm being – the point I'm trying to make here. He's he's for real. He might be, other than Brown, the best receiver in the NFL already. Oh, and he very well could be already, and and not to cut you off there, but a lot of people are saying that same thing. Um, I'm going to look at it the other way, that pretty much no matter what he does, it's almost going to feel like a disappointment because I'm almost expecting him, uh, based on those numbers, to get 150 catches. And here's the thing, who else did Eli Manning have to throw it to? A lot of times he just threw it up for grabs, and you know Odell being Odell, he did come down with it. But now with Victor Cruz going to be coming back, um, they're going to have a much more consistent play in the tight end game, I think, this year, as long as Donnell stays healthy. I worry about how many targets he's going to be able to get. He'll still get big numbers, but I'll tell you what, the reason why I'm going to have Antonio Brown as a first-round draft pick is because of that consistency in the high scoring. Odell Beckham, I'm not as confident that he's going to be able to do what uh, the numbers suggest he could do. So there's, there's my uh, discrepancy there and why I don't have Beckham quite as high. Well, makes sense, makes sense, but you know me, I take risks. Uh, that's just my strategy. Hey, that's a good risk because he's got the upside. If there's any guy on the list we're going to be talking about today, 
he's probably got the best upside possible. Um, another reason why uh, I like Brownwood and Beckham and reason why I kind of like my next guy on the list, Jordy Nelson, is, again, that consistency. And Jordy Nelson is a guy who's going to get you uh, the same sort of numbers every year. He's averaging 10 touchdowns each of the last four years. Uh, and the lowest he's had, seven touchdowns. And that was uh, the year that he missed four games. So, again, you look at a full season, he's right there at 10 touchdowns again. So, uh, that's why I got Jordy Nelson at number three. Do you worry about his age turning 30 at all? No, not really. I mean, you know, it's funny you brought that up. I mean, there's another big-time wide receiver who's turning 30, and a lot of people are worried about that, and that's Calvin Johnson. Calvin Johnson and Jordy Nelson are both top five fantasy wide receivers. And, you know, specifically with Nelson, he caught 98 passes for 1,519 yards and 13 touchdowns in 2014. And as long as Rodgers isn't hurt, I don't see why he can't put that up again. And as far as Calvin Johnson goes, yeah, he did miss some time this past season, but in the second half of the year, he went in the, over the 100-yard mark in three of his final contests and scoring five times. So, again, what do I say? What have you done for me? Going in towards the end of the season, he was playing really good. So, you know, he does tend to get hurt more than his fantasy owners would like, but he's still worth a late first-round fantasy pick, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I would say that any of these wideouts we're talking about here are uh, Brown, Beckham for sure, uh, first round. You could probably throw in Jordy Nelson in there first round. Any of the next four or five guys could be borderline first round in the second round. And I think that just goes to show you how much more of a – uh, wide out dominant, especially at the top of the list, how much wide out dominant this really is. And just to give another example, a guy that um, our cheat sheets and our, our friend, the mad scientist, aren't quite as big on, the guy by the name of Des Bryant. But when you look at it, the last three years, nobody scored more touchdowns than Des Bryant. 12, 13, and 16 touchdowns the last few years. Why so much hate on Des Bryant? I don't know, to be honest. I mean,. <sighs> You know, there were speculations that he'd hold out and miss games if he didn't sign a long-term contract extension. And, you know, we all know how that worked out. Uh, but, you know, like you said, the past three years, 1,225 yards and 12 touchdowns in each of his seasons. So, you know, he found the end zone 16 times last year, and there's no reason to think he'll slow down. So especially with that big contract he just got. And, you know, his stats might even be better with Murray gone. So, to me, I, I don't know why they hate, honestly. Uh, considering right now, I don't see there's a reason why he's not in your top five. I think he, sh he deserves to be. Um, he falls just outside in our, in our rankings, uh, or in the cheat sheet rankings, I should say. But I think it's pretty obvious that, that's, uh, that he's definitely the guy who I'm looking to pick up. Uh, especially if I have a late round pick, I'm looking to get two guys like a, a Des Bryant, Jordy Nelson, or a or a Des Bryant, AJ Green type guy. Um, but here's the other thing that really kind of baffles me. Maybe it's because of the injuries that we kind of forget about him, or maybe it's the fact he only scored six touchdowns last year. Julio Jones is a beast. If he's healthy, and if he has the guys around him like the uh, Roddy Whites who are also healthy. Can you imagine what a, a healthy Julio Jones for an entire year could do down in Atlanta? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, he's just – he's a genetic freak. He's a big, strong wide receiver. And, you know, he stayed healthy for the majority of last year. And what did that equate to? 140, 104 catches, 1,593 yards. So – but the thing is, he did score only six touchdowns, but, I mean, that might just be an aberration more than anything. He had 18 combined touchdowns in his first two NFL seasons, so, you know, if he remains on the field, he'll likely have more scores this coming season. So, I have a projected stat line, actually, of 102 catches, 1,580 yards, and nine total touchdowns, so... Look, you're pretty much straight on with what uh, with what my projections are, which is then how we end up with our uh, combined projections that you get on our cheat sheet. So uh, that's about right, eight to nine touchdowns. And if so, you're you got yourself in for a doozy of a year. And I'll tell you what, uh, if Brown or Beckham don't end up at the top slot, my guess is that Julio Jones would be the top fantasy wide receiver this year, just because of what he we know he's capable of doing. And after the last two years being a little bit disappointing. Uh, I think more than anything, he and Matt Ryan just want to get back on the same page of where they know they could be. All right, and last year, where did they go last year? It was like 4-12. and 12. 
And the year before that, they made it to the NFC Championship game. So that whole that was just a weird year in general last year. So, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt this upcoming year. Uh, Absolutely. Um, rounding out our consensus top ten at number six spot, we got Demarius Thomas. Number seven is where Calvin Johnson fell in. And then A.J. Green, Alshon Jeffrey, and Randall Cobb round out that top ten. Uh, I mean, we know what Demarius Thomas can do. He's going to put up double-digit touchdowns. He gets throws from Peyton Manning. Uh, there's nothing really to discuss there. Uh, of the other guys, A.J. Green, Alshon Jeffrey, Randall Cobb, which one of those are you most likely to uh, take that, that, I don't want to say a reach, but which one of those are you going to like best, and, and are, is any of them first round worthy? Um, I would go with A.J. Green out of the guys you just said. Um, I think a lot of it has to do, too, with like the weak pass defenses in the NFC North. You know, the Steelers, I, you know, I can't – it's going to be awful when Garoppolo, the Patriots quarterback, throws for, what, 600 yards against them, even uh, especially without Paul Ballou back there. I don't care if he's just a backup quarterback. The Steelers' def- pass defense is awful, and I'm not really high on the pass defense on the for the Browns and Ravens either. So I have a projected stat line for A.J. Green, like 95 receptions, 1,500 yards, and maybe 12 touchdowns. So, you know, he – he had a good year last year, 98, 98 catches, 1,426 yards and 11 touchdowns, but also he was banged up a little bit. Yeah, actually, yeah, he, I would he like was. to take that's, that back. Last year – That's two years ago. That's two yeah, years ago you're looking at. But, and and that's, no, that's what I'm looking at, though, is I'm looking at those two years ago stats because that's more of what you should expect if he stays healthy all year. And missing three games last year – uh, let's dive into that a little bit more because almost all the wideouts in this uh, in this range from about six to maybe twelve have that injury concern. They've missed games or they've been banged up. I mean, Calvin Johnson, the biggest example, he was never healthy last year. Uh, is there any? How do you combat that as a fantasy owner? Is there any way to combat that? I don't think you do. I, I mean, like remember the beginning of the show. What did I say? I feel like after the top five. You know, maybe may in the top ten, there's a considerable drop off with quality what you're getting out of re- the receivers. You, the rest, you know, you do have good wide receivers, but they're banged up or they're not the maybe not the primary receiver on their team. You no, know, Rand- Randall Cobb is the main wide receiver for the Packers. Who is it? Jordy Nelson. So I just feel like there's like this obvious, you know, drop off after that. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. I just feel like, you know, you have your top five wide receivers, and then, you know, that that's the first tier, the top five. The second tier is five to ten, and the third tier is ten to fifteen. So right. That just, uh, this is how I look at it. You know what I mean? No, Alex, I completely agree with, with all that there, and it's – it's tough to say because not only that, but then you end up at this next you know set of guys with some names that you know aren't the big huge names yet they get the job done when it comes to fantasy. You're talking guys like Mike Evans, uh, Kelvin Benjamin. I mean, throwing Jordan Matthews and it, it also I mean uh, guys who are up and coming a little bit more. The uh, the Edelmans, Emmanuel Sanders, uh, Brandon Cooks of the world. It, it com- becomes very very interesting. My question to you would be. Because uh, to me, a guy like a Mike Evans or a Kelvin Benjamin, even though they've shown they can do the work in their uh, in their first year in the league last year, are are you comfortable enough to take an early pick on a guy like them, or are you going to go for more of a, a guy who's done it before, like a Deshaun Jackson or Andre Johnson? Uh, even though like we all project them lower, but. You know, maybe they're the the more consistent guy. I don't know. What route do you look with that? Well, see, here's the thing. I mean, I've been kind of outspoken how my draft strategy, strategy is going to be this year. I'm going to want to stack up on receivers. But let's say, you know, I'm in a 12-person league and the top wide receivers go. You know what I mean? I'm left with the second-tier, third-tier wide receivers. You know what I mean? So I might the best wide receiver available might be a Mike Evans or uh, a Randall Cobb or something like that. So I don't know. Maybe if I had to take a shot on one of those guys, maybe being worth the first round would be Mike Evans. You know, he was been trying to improve his game all off season. He's been training with you know Randy Moss this off season. I don't know if Moss has been able to improve his game or if he's just been teaching the guy to moon and take plays off. I don't know. But you know, I, I honestly, I just, I'd be another thing with him. Be like a reach. You know what I mean? So I could see. 
Mike Evans really having a stellar year, or could have see him really having a bad year. But like, now let me let me stop you right there. How does having Jameis Winston as your quarterback? How does that affect the draft status of Mike Evans? But see, that's the thing. Everyone's like, oh yeah, you're gonna take a shot at the guy who's a rookie quarterback throwing to him. Um, okay, remember Cam Newton? Was it like three years ago, four years ago? Um, we saw how that turned out. Also, remember the Buccaneers are gonna be playing from behind a lot. And the rookie quarterback, Davis Winston, is going to be throwing to his top target a lot just to catch up Mike Evans. So just kind of by the nature of the way things are working, just how it's going to play out, he's going to get his fair share of balls. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point right there about a team playing from behind. That can end up being a big difference there. Um, here's another name we really haven't uh, dissected much. You and I are both a lot higher on him uh, than the mad scientist. T.Y. Hilton. I mean, still obviously the number one there, but you got a lot of targets out there, and now including Andre Johnson moving uh, out to Indianapolis. What's your thought process? Does having Andre Johnson help? Does it hurt? Does it do nothing? Well, I mean, you know, we were talking about this before the show about Andre Johnson, and I'm not super high on him, but, you know, he's still enough to get his fair share of reception. So I, I think the fact that there is – um, you know, that there is other options for Luck there. I think just by the nature of that, it does kind of drop his value. You know what I mean? A little bit. So I, I would say it drops him maybe into, you know, the 15 to 20 range or, you know, between 11 and 15 or something like that. So, yeah, I, I do think him having other targets down there does kind of decrease it. Maybe not too much, though. That's just my opinion. Right. Um, here's a couple other names just with a, a, a kind of similar idea. you got Sammy Watkins in Buffalo, DeAndre Hopkins in Houston, and uh, you can probably even throw in Deshaun Jackson uh, in, in this mix as well. Definitely Brandon Marshall in New York. Guys who we don't know what to expect from the quarterback position, uh, just kind of the same way that we had with, uh, with um, uh, Mike Evans down in, uh, down in Tampa Bay. Do you look at those guys differently, not knowing, A, what quarterback's going to be behind center, and B, whether or not they're going to be successful or not? I mean, just the uncertainty of it, I think you have to kind of – I think it does affect your draft strategy. I think it it has to. It's just natural. You know, you want to know who's throwing him the ball. So, in short, yeah. I mean, I don't know how else I could really say it. I don't see why this is so hard to understand. If you don't know who you're – quarterback's going to be, then how can you make an informed decision? How well, and I, I think a lot of people end up seeing the name Brandon Marshall or Deshaun Jackson getting up near the top of their cheat sheets, and then they kind of overlook all the other guys that uh, are still above them and say, oh, big name, I know him, I know he's done it before, okay, I take him. You can't do that, people. You could just end up ruining yourself, and especially – you know, Brandon Marshall, he may have been all right. Actually, he could be even better, to be honest, now that Geno Smith is no longer going to be the starting quarterback for the first part of the year uh, in New York. Uh, I don't know. A guy like Marshall and Jackson, they both struggled last year, but at the same time, you look at their stats, Brandon Marshall still had eight touchdowns. Deshaun Jackson still had over 1,000 yards and six touchdowns himself. So, I mean, even with some quarterback issues that those two had last year, they still did all right for themselves. So I guess what I'm saying is don't think that a having a lack of a quarterback is going to absolutely kill one of the receivers, but at the same time, don't expect uh, them to just absolutely flourish either. You have to be kind of kind of balanced and kind of in the middle, and which is why you said it best. As soon as you get past you know number 12 to 15, it's just a huge drop-off in terms of, you know, of what to expect because I could see anybody – uh, in our list here, going through numbers 15 through even up to number 30, any one of them could boom up to be a top five receiver, and any one of them could be, you know, waiver wire material within the first five weeks and be off your roster forever. Exactly, exactly. And, and I guess the question to you then is how it, there's obviously no way for you to predict what's going to happen, which one of those guys is going to be boom or bust. How do you go about your, your draft strategy, not only in the early rounds, but maybe in the later rounds as well? What do you do? Do you get a lot of wide receivers? Do you try to stack up heavy on the first couple big guys? What What's your idea? It depends how it's going. Like I, I just said this like a few moments ago. 
If I'm drafting at the end of my league, at the end of the first round, and I'm like number 12, and I get two picks in a row, then yeah, I probably will go two wide receivers. But let's say of all the top, let's say for whatever reason, the people in my league have the same idea as me, and they the top five, five receivers are gone. Then I might change up my strategy. And then you'll try to, and then you'll try to get the. You gotta get, you know, it's best available. It's value. Hey, value. I know you like that. Yeah, I mean, ideally, yeah, I want to make my team strong at wide receivers, but just by the way the draft works out, I might not have that chance, and I might be forced to, you know, draft a running back or a tight end or a quarterback or something like that. It all depends, but ideally, I'm gonna try and make on my wide receivers to be the strongest part of my team. Right. Now, uh, one last topic of conversation before we wrap things up here. Uh, once you get out of those top tiers and now you're getting into, you know, your third or fourth wideout probably being drafted. Well, hopefully this is about your third or fourth wideout being drafted. You got a lot of big names, you know, like the Roddy White, Larry Fitzgerald, Steve Smith, uh, throwing Anquan Bolden, Percy Harvin, uh, even Eric Decker. You have a lot of those big names, but then you also have some of the not-so-big names, such as a uh, Rashad Perriman or Charles Johnson or uh, Kevin White in Chicago uh, going to go deep. Even you can throw in Devontae Parker or Kevin Stills. Uh, I guess my question to you, because you have those big names there, are you more likely to go with that big name who you know has done things in the past? No. Or do no, you take no. Big- this, it's a different time. Maybe, you know – Six years ago, but the way the NFL is now, no, you got to be sure of who you're picking. I'm more inclined nowadays in today's NFL to pick young, potentially breakout wide receivers. So you would be getting the Allen Robinsons and the Charles Johnsons of the world rather than the Victor Cruz and Percy Harvins. Yeah, because their time is running out. You, I mean, you want to you want a receiver that could potentially break out this year. I mean, not like Larry Fitzgerald, he's so he's so different. If he just had like, if he had, if he was in a, if he had a great quarterback thrown to him, that changes up everything, you know. But he, other than Kurt Warner, he's never really had that. So I mean, if I am gonna take a, a shot on a big name, it'd be Fitzgerald. Other than that, no. Other than that, no. I'm going with the young, potentially breakout wide receivers. And I I think this is about the one spot where I'm gonna disagree with you mainly because I don't know which one of these young guys is going to break out. I don't know which guy is going to be the Odell Beckham and which one is going to be the Cordero Patterson who did absolutely nothing uh, in his past year when everybody thought he'd be great. So I'm more like... It depends where you're drafting, I think, too. Like, if it's late, if it's in the later, later rounds and you're presented with that opportunity, yeah. If it's kind of in the middle of your draft or late middle, then, yeah, I could see maybe going for one of those guys. Yeah, I think... At that point, when you're getting your number three or number four, you need to be thinking, you need to be thinking something that you can get consistent points. Because here's the other thing too: a, a lot of the guys who we saw break out last year, uh, for example, Allen Robinson had a a pretty good year, came up strong at the right points. He was undrafted in like 99 percent of leagues. Marquise Lee, same team, undrafted in almost all leagues. Dontre Moncrief, man, he came up strong at the end for Indianapolis. Definitely uh, undrafted, same as Devontae Adams in Green Bay. A lot of those guys who were the big name uh, and big performers like that out of nowhere were literally out of nowhere to the point that you weren't even drafting them. So uh, while it's possible that one of these guys we've been talking about could be huge, it's also just as likely that they could be coming off of the waiver wire. So I'm going to try to sneak in some guys who I know are going to get me the consistent points. Roddy White, even with a terrible year last year, still scored uh, seven touchdowns. Uh, and that, that's the stuff that I love is when you can have a bad year and everybody says, wow, how terrible Roddy White was last year. Um, you realize he still scored seven touchdowns, right? Anquan Bolden, same way. 49ers were pathetic last year. He still had over 1,000 yards and five scores. You know, that's a solid wideout three. If you draft him as a wideout three and that's what he gets, I'd be ecstatic. Right, right. Yeah, makes sense to me. Can't disagree with you there. All right. Uh well, that's going to just about do it here for our wide receiver rankings. Make sure you check out all of our position rankings here at 360sportsnetwork.com. And, of course, our customizable cheat sheets are now up and running, and I know you better be as excited as Mr. Delaverson is over there about that because that means you go and plug in your stats, 
and you see exactly where uh, all, all your players need to line up and see just how low a Des Bryant really should be uh, versus how high he technically is. Final thoughts from the Saint. Um, my final thoughts is that I'm going to repeat as champion this year in our 360 Sports Network League. That is. Oh, my- there he goes again. Well, since you brought it up, we are going to be having uh, a, a post draft special uh, when our 360 Sports Network League drafts. We'll be going through that little draft with you, breaking down all the analysis and uh, figuring out exactly, you know, what teams look good, what teams look bad, and and all that good stuff to give you a better idea of what to expect when it comes to draft day. Well, on that happy note, thanks for tuning in. Happy drafting, and welcome back to Pro Football. Have a good night.